Yeah, well, welcome everybody. I recognize a few. There's quite a few new faces in here. Um, for all those who don't know me, I'm an irrigation engineer with Agriculture Canada. Most of my work's out at CSIDC, uh, born and raised here. Used to uh, slave away from my father as an irrigation dealer, so I've been around this for probably as old as I could walk. He was probably sticking me in the field doing something. Um, so what I want to talk to you guys about today is uh, the new irrigation scheduling manual. It's um, located on your table. I have extra, we have a whole bunch of extra copies here. Please take them home or share them with people. It's a, it's a pretty nice manual. I didn't do, I did the boring writing, but Earl Svensson out of Saskatoon did all the, a lot of the design layout. So that, what, what this did was it replaced the old ICDC uh, manual, so that you've probably been familiar with it. Um, so then in 2017, we partnered with ICDC and the Ministry of Saskatchewan, some local producers, to develop the, the new manual that came out um, late last year, or I guess early 2022. Um, so again, what we were doing was it hadn't been updated in a while. There's been quite a few advancements in the technology available. Um, added a lot more pictures, graphs, um, quite a few more examples, which I always find is useful when working through some of these techniques. Um, and again, uh, just an upgraded layout and design. Uh, just so you're aware, we are working with the with um, collaborators in Alberta and Saskatchewan and Manitoba at coming up with a, a prairie resource. Um, probably won't vary a whole bunch from this um, layout. It'll just have more examples from across the prairies and hopefully leverage some of the work that we've already done to help share with farmers across Western Canada. Um, so how the irrigation scheduling manual is broken down, we have the fundamentals which uh, Morgan and Sarah had already touched on, getting to the hand feel and some of the soil based methods which Kara um, had just described. Um, there, there's also some other soil based scheduling methods that Aaron's going to come up and talk to you about. Um, most of what I'm going to talk about is the plant based and climatic uh, scheduling. Um, so this is kind of the new new way we're going into things is uh, using the crop canopy and, and remote sensing to schedule irrigation so that's more applicable in, in some of this variable rate or spatial application of irrigation. Um, and again this uh, manual like there's quite a bit of data, extra data and uh, examples at the back so it can help you work through some of these examples in your field. Um, so each scheduling method, uh, I've tried to break it down with an overall description of the method. Some of the just fast pros and cons of each method, like some of these are quite expensive, some you can do them um, on your own. Um, and then a step-by-step -step how to, but uh, again, want to point out examples. Um, so it help you really work through. Um, if you do have difficulty with some or want some further explanation, you can contact the province because well, I can help you too, but I'll let you do, I'll let them do the, the legwork for me. Okay, so just uh, getting into plant-based irrigation scheduling. So um, what we're doing here is we're using remote sensing, different um, spatial uh, wavelengths to estimate crop water stress. Um, so the big two is NDVI, so a lot of you guys have been familiar with NDVI is used as a gauge of crop health. Um, it's, it's pretty up, applicable in um, uh, fertility based uh, treatments for knowing uh, if the N um, is there for you. But uh, we're going to use it in terms of if the crop is stressed and how developed the canopy is to estimate the irrigation requirements. Uh, the other um, method is uh, canopy temperature. So you have to kind of think of it as yourself, like as you're becoming dehydrated or don't have enough uh, moisture in yourself, you will start to heat up compared to your surroundings. If, if the plant has enough moisture in the ground and has access to that moisture, 
It's got the ability to transpire and, and reduce its temperature compared to the surroundings. So we're going to use that also as a, a method for irrigation scheduling. Um, but the key, I mean, these are ideal for uh, spatial application, spatial variability, because a lot of the remote sensing, you can take a, an image of your whole field at one time. Um, but again, this is more of a trigger. Um, the uh, a thermal um, reading isn't going to tell you, well, that means I need one inch. It's going to tell you, okay, here's my trigger point. Now I have to apply water. If you're unable to keep up with that trigger point, you should you should up your irrigation amount. If you're keeping up with it, then you can keep on that way. But it doesn't really give you a, a full um, quantitative amount of water to apply. Uh, so the first one, <coughs> NDVI. Um, so again, it's, a, it's basically taking the red and the uh, near infrared bands, and it's an it's a index to basically estimate crop health. Um, so you can get this from um, handheld units, uh, Green Seeker, I think Trimble makes it, it's called the Green Seeker, it's just a handheld unit that you can hold over a crop. Um, I do a lot of my research on drones, but if you have a drone kicking around, it's pretty time consuming for irrigation scheduling, but um, it's useful. And then I'll get into satellite. So this is kind of where the IRICAN uh, website's coming in. We'll I'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, but most service providers will have a NDVI uh, mapping service available for purchase. Um, but what I want to point out here is, okay, so this is a, a field trial we have out at the CSIDC. It's a little hard to see with the lighting, but um, on the right, right of this red dotted line is actually dry land. You can see over the last couple of years, the alfalfa hasn't done very well under dry land conditions. You can see it patchy. Visual eye, we can see that this area has been dry and crops not doing good. But if you look at the remaining field, I mean, you gotta trust me because it's hard to see, but I mean, it's a fairly green, fairly um, uniform field in terms of density and health. But if you look under it, uh, under the NDVI scale at the bottom, you can start seeing some issues with dryness or um, showing up under the NDVI that you can't pick out um, using uh, just your visual eye. So, I mean, that's the, the key takeaway is NDVI kind of can help pick up some of the issues before they become visible in your field. Um, so, the one, uh, one uh, research project we're working on right now is we're trying to develop these NDVI temperature differential curves. So, uh, vertical scale, you have your NDVI. Um, horizontal scale, you have your differential temperature. So. As the crop's healthier, you can see that it's doing a better job of controlling um, its temperature compared to the surrounding air temperature. So it's actually, in some cases, the canopy is quite a bit cooler than the actual surrounding air temperature. Um, and then as you get lower, you're probably into bare ground at the bottom. You're still cooler under a well irrigated soil compared to a dry soil. So we're kind of picking that halfway point as your trigger. So as you got a bit of an example here, so we're going to create these trapezoids and we'll probably eventually make these available in the manual. But let's say I have a canopy temperature of 24 degrees Celsius. We know it's 25 in the air and we look at the, an NDVI, you can use the Green Seeker or um, your local satellite imagery or whatever. We're okay. So we're approaching the dry, so we might decide to, it might be time to irrigate now or soon. But if we do it again and the canopy temperature is 30 and the NDVI of 0.4, well, we're already past that line. So that's our trigger that we need to apply more water. So we will apply our one inch or whatever, or half an inch, depending on the time of year. And then if we can keep up with that, then we just keep that going. If, if it starts, moving further along this access, then we're, no, we're knowing we're not putting enough water on. Um, so again, not a mount, it's just a trigger point. Um, 
And the one tricky part about thermal is that all kind of needs to be taken around solar noon. So you're looking at between 1 and 2 uh, p.m. Early in the day, the, the, the crop is actually cooler than the surrounding temperature <coughs> quite a bit. It's not having to be um, stressed at all. Um, and then later in the day, it gets warmer. Temperature starts to fall, but the crop still has that stored energy. So you got to kind of try to pick around noon. And so eventually we want to get to a point with a tool with that method, but <clears throat> for the NDVI-based method, so we're just using crop health to determine what we think are... Have anybody utilized the A model in the past or...? Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. We have this thing called the crop water use coefficient. So basically, it's like what uh, Morgan and them had described, that we know a crop at, at um, reproductive stage is going to use this much water, and a crop at beginning stage is going to use this much water. So that crop water use coefficient is going to go up at, until, right, or until reproductive stage, um, and then start dropping down at ripening and stuff. So what we've done, and we worked with the researchers in Australia, is that we're linking that crop water use coefficient to NDVI. So we're taking that out. Like right now to do that, you're just estimating it based on days from planting, what that crop water use coefficient are. With this model, we're actually using the NDVI measurements from your actual field to estimate how much um, water your crops going to use. So the IRCAN model, um, if you go to www.irican.com or there's another website, um, it should be in your book. Sometimes you'll get this weird uh, certifi security certificate's not working. Um, that's just on our end, our programmer. We need to update it once in a while, but you can just trust the website and and ignore that warning <laughs> for now. <laughs> um, so with the model, you go in, you have to create an account. So basically, we don't see any of your private information. The only reason we want you to create an account is so that you can save your fields within the software and just easily access them for next time. It's just so you don't lose your spot of all the work that you've done. So once you log in, you will get this, so there's a pointer, pointer all does the, it. All the way to, that side, there you go. See that? Ooh. So you'll get, you'll get this, uh, this is the home screen. Um, basically you'll have to, a button on the top says go to my location, that'll, default to your IP address, so if you're at your farm or in the city or something, it's going to default that. You can also search uh, your location, so it's typical Google Maps. If you put in Outlook Saskatchewan, it's going to allow you to zoom right there. Um, then there's a My Fields section, that's where you're going to populate your fields, um, and then Measuring Distance, and I'll go through a little bit. But this is your basic home screen. Um, so when you want to start to create a field within this software, you'll click on the My Fields. Um, I've populated a few, but right now it would, it would say nothing for a new user. And then there's this button called Add New Field right at the top. Um, so once you add a field, um, that, that will uh, drop off and you'll get this polygon. Um, adder. It's pretty hard to see because it's in black, but allow you to select the, the boundary points on your field. You close the boundary and then you save new field. Um, so once you save your field, you're going to have to input some um, field details. So basically I've added the uh, ICDC airport land, so that's their new land out just outside CSIDC. Um, It'll give you the soil type. So again, like Karis said, it's very important in irrigation scheduling to know your soil type, or at least have a, a pretty good understanding of what is the general soil texture in your field to help properly schedule. Uh, crop type, 
Initial soil moisture, um, this is just to kind of account for soil moisture below your rooting zone. I mean, it's not an ideal for this uh, model, but uh, it's just kind of allow us to consider um, the moisture below the rooting zone. And as the plant progresses through the rooting zone, it's accessing that new moisture and planting date. <clears throat> so this information is important because this is basically creating that water balance um, bucket. Like it's a, we call it a bucket model. So you got to, um, think about your soil as a bucket, right? Like I have this much storage, I can keep putting water into it. Eventually it's gonna overflow. You're gonna lose that water to run off or deep drainage. And you don't want that because you get deep drainage, you're gonna lose some of your nutrients in that and that's lost dollars. Um, and then as the crop uses it, it empties that bucket and you don't want that bucket to ever get emptied. So these, uh, this information is giving you that um, background that you need for this model. So once you create your field, there was a save field button at the bottom. Um, it turns from black to red and there's your new field. Um, so this field's now saved under your my fields. Um, so once you do that, you, you, with your cursor you have to click within the field boundaries. By clicking in that, then it starts chugging along and starts generating the, the model and it's doing the water balances right now. So it's going out and collecting all the data from the NDVI, um, which I'll show you in a bit. It's also collecting all the um, weather data from an API. Uh, it's an online uh, service provider that's providing all the information weather-wise based on your field location. Um, and then it's taking your input data and running the model. Note, sometimes, especially out in Outlook area, <laughs> the uh, data speeds are a little bit low and lag, so you, will, you may get a, a notification that it's waiting to respond. Just ignore that it, or, or wait a little bit longer, and it will chug through it and, and populate on your end. But, um, so then once you get that, you'll have this, you'll have some extra information. You can have, um, input irrigation uh, throughout the year. So it's just, a, it's just a calendar. So you have your tabs, irrigation input, water balance, field, settings, uh, weather tab, and advanced, but we won't go into the advanced. So in your irrigation input, you can click on the date that you've added irrigation, enter it. Um, it's all in millimeters just for <coughs> work with the uh, weather um, data. So yeah, you would go in and enter any irrigation event that you have or you can simulate. I'm going to add irrigation on Tuesday, see what's going to happen, right? Make sure you hit, once you've entered that, make sure you hit save changes. Um, if not, it won't, it won't put it back into the model. Once you hit save changes, it'll actually kick you out to the map again. And then you have to do, go through and click within the field boundaries again, <clears throat> just because it needs to repopulate the, the model. But here's a basic water balance. So this is what the graph's going to look like. So we've kind of estimated that top orange curve on here. That's your field capacity or kind of what Kara was um, describing. The bottom line is permanent wilting point. We just have a flat line on the bottom that says this is permanent wilting point. Don't hit that line. But we've added this like pink it, pinkish area. That's going to be your trigger point. So that's about 50% of that. That's 50% of the dif distance between field capacity and permanent wilting point. So <clears throat> it's okay to go on the pink, but just try to try to stay above that. But as you can see, like I, um, ooh, sorry, wrong. So I've added the two irrigation vents on the 27th and the 31st of May. And as you can see in the, in the model, it's picked those up. So this is going to go up and down depending on, um, the evaporative use. So it's, that's being modeled based on the weather data and the NDVI. 
and then what your input is um, based on irrigation and it's also um, grabbing uh, rainfall data <coughs> from the server so it's going up and down for you you would just have to um, just keep an eye on it um, and then again how I described the weather tab the one thing I want to point, so this will give you everything that we need to run the evapotranspiration model. You don't, I, some of it's not beneficial for you to look at, but it's just for us just to make sure that we have all that data um, that we need to drive that evaporation model. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is that um, we are, we do give the producer the ability to overwrite precipitation. Um, as you know, like rainfall can change within a mile. So <clears throat> like right now, this says 0.44 millimeters, which is probably not, <laughs> you can't pick that up anyway, but your rain gauge is probably showing you 25 millimeters at one time. You have the ability, if it doesn't, something doesn't look right, you can overwrite that um, in the water balance. <clears throat> and the one key, with this uh, tool is that it's, it's providing you NDVI imagery on your field. Um, because we need that information to drive our ET model, but also it's beneficial for you as, a, as an irrigator or a farmer in general to look, oh, well, there's some strange things going on in my field or there's some crop health issues. <clears throat> as you can see, there's a landing strip down the middle of this field. Um, it's still showing up. I'm guessing it will be for a few years, um, but I guess not many guys farm a, an airport. Um, so we've given you the ability to, because this information is freely available, most of this data is from the European Space Agency, so we're providing this free of charge. Um, you can see your, your weekly NDVI data through this. So. As long as you, on the top, so in that box on the left, you have NDVI KC, so that KC is that crop water use coefficient, and cloud cover. Um, but click on the NDVI, and you can go back even a couple of years to see previous NDVI images um, for those weekly timestamps. So again, this is July, 24th to 31st of last year. So everything looking pretty uniform out there on the field, except for that strip down the middle. Um, again, KC, it's, it's just a simple linear calculation, but um, you can see a little bit of difference. So, I mean, basically that, that landing strip isn't going to use as much water as the healthy crop beside it, right? So we're using this model to help drive that. We know that that, that crop that's beside the landing strip is going to use more water and need to be irrigated more often than the, the le less healthy crops. And you can see dry land pasture area and the corners of the pivots on some of these fields that aren't going to need water, right? Or, well, they would need water, but we can't get them water anyway, so. <clears throat> and just for a bonus, we added a, a mapping tool, um, some producers had asked for it. Um, so up in this, sorry, there's a measuring, measure distance uh, tool in the corner. So when you click on that, you can trace out your field or trace out just, oh, what's that two acres that I isn't producing? You can find out exactly how big that is by tracing around it. They'll give you the perimeter and it'll also give you a total area and acres. And then the final thing I want to point out with anything satellite based is you've got to be wary of cloud cover, especially NDVI. Um, so you may get your model and it may not show something's quite right. That just might be cloud cover and it, it's not, the model's not running properly because as you can see, for the most part, it's taking three or four measurements throughout the week, but if you get a few extended days of cloud cover, you are not going to get a good NDVI image during that week, and it's, it's just going to show up something like this. Um, 
So again, there's always pitfalls to, to every type of technology. We are trying to work on a solution where we can maybe model based on previous and post NDBI, but until that happens, just be leery of, of cloud cover. And so that's it. So if anybody has questions on the irrigation manual or IRCAN, um, I can answer some or, or email or talk to me whenever. <laughs>